Hi, I'm Jacinta. Hi, I'm Vanessa. We are Strange Colony, and you are tuning in to our true crime story time. Mm. Oh, we didn't brainstorm. <laughs> no. Oh, my God. I was actually... Once I had um, done that thing... Oh, done that thing the other week with all the... Um downloading sounds and stuff like that, I was going to send some to you. Yes, do that. <laughs> I will do that. Do My bad. Then I'll do the thing. <laughs> and then the thing will be done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how uh, you been this week, Ness? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty I've been good. sleeping a lot. <laughs> you know, can't complain with that, right? I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'm going to say that uh, life with a toddler and a baby do not lend too much sleep. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. Nah. Yeah, we've all been sick this last week, so. Mm. Yes, everybody's all sensitive and sooky and, you know, the kids are almost as bad as I am. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. What's kept you busy this week, though? I've been planning a holiday for next year. Oh. I'm going to take my first trip overseas. Yay. I'm so excited. That's exciting. It is. It is. Like, literally, I have never left the country. It's about time, then. It is. Absolutely. And I started car shopping because I am, like, this close to getting my license, finally. Oh. oh, is there any particular type of car that you're looking at? Uh, just some sort of, like, I'm just going to be. A, it out. I'm just going to be a basic bitch and get an SUV. <laughs> <laughs> Come I on. I that hard because I own an SUV. <laughs> I know. I'm a mid-30s mum, like, come on. We need the space. We need the space and we need comfort. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, so, yeah. Shall I just Let's get, go. In it, get into it? Yes. <laughs> so okay. today, today we're going to be discussing Lady Leatherface. Yeah, I know. Very provocative nickname that she's got there. Hey. <laughs> so Lady Leatherface, well, her actual name is Catherine Mary Knight, her story is one that has a very sad beginning and a very twisted end. So Catherine's mother, Barbara Ruffin, was married to one Jack Ruffin and had four sons before she decided to begin an affair with Ken Knight, who was one of Jack's friends and co-workers. Now, they lived in Aberdeen a small New South Wales town and the current population is in like the 1800s so it would have been like tiny tiny small town and as is commonplace with towns of a certain size the affair was basically social suicide for both Barbara and Ken and they were forced out of town had to move on to Moree which roughly the same size town Um, none of the boys went with the brother the eldest two yeah. stayed with their dad, Jack, and the youngest two went to live with an auntie in Sydney. So it was out of this affair that Catherine was born. Yeah, this is the start mm. of her story. So she was born October 24th in 1955. So Barbie then went had four more kids in Ken with Ken, one of those obviously being Catherine. Uh, and Catherine was part of a set of twins. She was born in Tenterfield, which is about twice the size of the other towns. Now, when Catherine was four, her eldest brothers came to live with them after their father died. Okay. Now, Ken was an abusive alcoholic, and he would rape Barbie up to ten times a day. And on her own end, Barbie would discuss with her daughters in detail the sexual abuse that she had suffered and how much she hated both men and sex. Yes. And Catherine was also sexually abused by family members, not her father, up until age 11. 
The details of her claims have been questioned by psychologists, but family members have confirmed the basic account of the assault. So the what, we're not sure about, but the whether or not it happened, it happened. So on top of this, they were also hiding an Aboriginal heritage on Barbie's side due to the severe racism at the time. It's something that Barbara struggled with because she was quite proud of her culture. Um, and this she took out on the kids. Apart from her twin sister, the only person Catherine was close to was her uncle, Oscar Knight. He was a champion horseman. However, he committed suicide in 1969 when oh no. Catherine was hitting like her early puberty years. Oh no. And she was left absolutely devastated. And then, just to top matters off, the family uprooted, moved back to Aberdeen the same year. So, That's a lot. That's a lot. So she attended Musselbrook, I think it's Musselbrook or is it Muswellbrook <laughs> High School, and is remembered by classmates as being a loner and a bully. She assaulted at least one boy with a weapon and was injured by a teacher when the teacher defended themselves from one of her attacks. So she ended up leaving school at age 15. She hadn't even learned how to read or write properly. Yeah. Uh, she originally became a cutter at a clothing factory, which she stayed at for about a year or so, and then she went on to obtain what she has described as her dream job. Oh gosh. Cutting up offal at the local abattoir. Now, Catherine I mean, had a knack for knife work and was quickly promoted to boning and given her own set of butcher's knives. And she was known to have hang those knives over her bed at home so they would always be handy if I need them in every house she lived in up until her incarceration. Given her upbringing and the fact that she's constantly running on survival mode, that's not really surprising. No. Like, it's a different mindset to what most people um, have within themselves. But once you've grown up in that sort of environment, yeah, yep. constantly in survival mode, you're always wondering about those what ifs and really concerned with self-protection. Yep. Catherine met her first husband, David Stanford Kellett, in 1973 at the ripe age of 18 years old. Kellett was a heavy drinker. Thanks to some good old trauma, he picked up working at a railway job in the Coffs Harbour. Mm -hmm. First, his friend was killed in front of him in a shunting accident. Oh, my God. And then later, he rescued injured occupants of a school bus in Kempsey, which had been struck by a train, killing six children. In the end, poor Dave lost his job due to deteriorating performance and behaviour, which led to him getting work near the abattoir and becoming friends with one of Knight's brothers. Now, whenever Kellett got into a fight, Knight would be, like, right there, ready to go, ready to back him up with her fists. And she already had a reputation in Aberdeen for beating up anyone who upset her. Oh, wow. In 74, Kellett and Knight got married. On her request, they arrived at the ceremony with him riding Pillion, drunk, on her, on her motorcycle. So, it's a super classy affair. Oh, yeah. I guess that's um, our version of the, of the uh, Vegas wedding, I suppose. Pretty close, too. A little more hick-like, though. Yeah. When he was interviewed that night, Kellett said that uh, good old Barb gave him some advice on the day of the wedding. Here's a quote. The old girl said to me, watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think about playing up on her, which means cheating for those who aren't, don't speak Australian. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got, she's got a screw loose somewhere. Gee, I wonder how that happened. Yeah. Barbie had nothing to do with that. No. Turns out, though, Kellett didn't have to wait long to realise just how right good old Barb was. Knight attempted to strangle him on their wedding night. Because, what the what? 
get this. He fell asleep after only having sex with her three times. Like, shh, this one, this one is crazy. Three times is an admirable effort. I know. Go, Dave. Yeah. And also, run, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the marriage was a violent one. And on one occasion, a heavily pregnant knight burned all of Kellett's clothes and shoes before doing a complete tangled moment and slogging him on the head with a frying pan. And this was because he had arrived home late from a darts competition after reaching the finals. Oh my god. Poor Kellett, fearing for his life, fled before collapsing on a neighbour's house and was treated for a severely fractured skull. Police wanted to charge Knight, but she flipped the switch, like all successful abusers do, and Swing oh. talked Kellett into dropping the charges. Ooh. So, Tangled is never going to look the same to me after this one. No. No. Soon after Knight had their first child, Melissa Ann, who was born in May 1976, Kellett got out from under her. He ran away to Queensland with another woman. He was completely done with her abuse. The very next day, Knight was seen pushing her new baby in a pram down the main street, flinging the pram around the place, endangering the infant. So she was committed to St. Elmo's Hospital in Tamsworth under the diagnosis for postnatal depression. Several weeks later, she was released and she went on to place two-month-old Melissa on a railway track shortly before the train was due to arrive. She then stole an axe, made her way into town and threatened to kill multiple people. Now, Melissa was rescued by an old vagrant known around town as Old Ted. He happened to be foraging near the tracks only a few minutes before the train passed by. Oh my God. Again, Catherine was arrested and again she was committed, but she signed herself out the next day after recovering. And what happens with her daughter? Actually not sure what happened with the daughter at this stage. But a few days later, she slashed a woman's face with one of her prized knives and demanded that the woman drive her to find Kellett in Queensland. Oh, my God. Like, this is, like, horror movie stuff at this point. Like, this poor woman managed to escape because they stopped at a service station. Like, that kind of horror movie trope. And by the time that police got to the scene, Knight had taken a young boy hostage and was threatening his life with her knife. I will say (laughs) the way that the police managed to disarm her, they attacked her with brooms. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, if it's effective. I I mean, woman is unhinged. Completely. I mean, there's, I suffered abuse when I was young and there's, I am absolutely back crap crazy and she has just, just dove right into the, Ladder. Yeah. So, yeah, police attacked her with brooms, managed to disarm her, and then she was admitted into the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. Nurses say that Knight told them she was going to kill the mechanic at the service station because he had repaired Kellett's car, which had allowed him to leave. And then she was going to go to Queensland, find her husband and his mother, and kill them too. What? I think that's the unbelievable part. The unbelievable part is that when police informed Kellett, he left his girlfriend to move back to Aberdeen to support Knight. He got out. Why would you come back? Why? She's not getting any better. Nope. (sighs) Knight was released August 9th, 1976, into the care of her mother-in-law and her husband, and they moved to Ipswich, where she got a job at the Dinmore Meatworks. In 1980, they had another daughter. Because that's a great environment to bring children into. Natasha Marie. And in 1984, Knight actually left Kellett. Okay. Yes. Kellett is not the murder victim. Right. Yeah. Plot twist. 
Yeah. So she first moved to her parents' place in Aberdeen and then she got a place near Musselbrook. She did initially return to her job at the Abattoir in Aberdeen, but she injured her back. Next year she went on disability pension and obtained government housing through the commission. And so she yeah. got a place in Aberdeen proper. Now in 1986, Knight met... David Saunders, who was a 38-year-old minor. Only a couple of months after meeting, he'd moved in with her and her daughters, but he kept his apartment in Scone. Scone? Scone? Mm. Now, Knight became jealous whenever he was not in her presence and threw him out regularly. Then he would move back to his apartment and then she would follow and beg him to return and he would come back and repeat toxic, abusive BS. Yeah. In May 1987, she slit the throat of his two-month-old dingo pup in front of him. Just to give him an example of what would ever happen if he had an affair. And true to fashion, she knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. In June 88, she had a third daughter, Sarah, which prompted Saunders to put a deposit on a house which Knight then paid off when her workers' comp came through in 89. Yeah. Knight decorated the house with animal skins, skulls, horns, rusty animal traps, leather jackets, old boots, machetes, rakes, pitchforks. Literally the whole house was covered, including the ceilings. Okay, a bit OTT, but I'm digging the aesthetic she's going for. I do not. Not for little kids that are growing up in an abusive household that has rusty freaking animal traps hanging on the walls. I mean, a few here and there would be kind of cool, just as like a feature piece. <laughs> you cut from a different cloth mess. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I could have been her. <laughs> no, no, you couldn't have, because this gets worse. Oh, God. Saunders actually managed to escape after an argument where she hit him in the face with an iron before stabbing him in the abdomen with a pair of scissors. Oh, my God. He moved back to Scone and she shredded all his clothes whilst he was gone. He then actually took long service leave from his work to go into hiding to escape her. And she, like, tried to track him down, chatted to everyone they knew. No one was giving up the location, right? So what did she do? She went to the police, told them that she was afraid for her life, took out an AVO, apprehended violence order, against him and made it impossible for him to see his daughter when he came back to try and see her. Oh, damn. Not only is she psychotic, like, this woman is calculating. I... Very much, one of my pet peeves is women who abuse the system that looks on them more favorably in domestic violence situations. Absolutely. They I are agree. loathsome, foul creatures. It's and like oh, false rap the level rape of It yes. is hard enough for um, these things to be taken seriously without people lying about it and shining yes. like a false light on anyone who might put it out. Yes. It makes me so mad. Yes. So, yeah, she did that. And that was the end of that relationship. So Saunders, Saunders got away with only a stab wound and a concussion. Only. <laughs> only. Oh, wow. Next was John Chillingworth. He actually got off the lightest, okay? He's also not the victim. He was a 43-year-old abattoir worker. He met her in 91, and the following year, they had a son named Eric. Now, the relationship lasted three years, and then she left him for a man that she'd allegedly been cheating on him with for some time, John Price. It's the only reason okay. I mention Johnny Boy here is literally because she had a son by him. Like, there okay. is nothing to suggest that their relationship was as abusive as the others. So, yeah. But... The man she cheated on him with, John Price. We finally made it to our victim. Oh gosh. Yep. So John Charles Thomas Price, you know that's the victim when you get the full name. Yeah. Was the father, a father of three, whose marriage had ended in 1988. 
Now, his two-year-old daughter lived with his former wife and his older two children lived with him. Price was completely aware of, of Knight's violent reputation, but she still moved into his house in 95. And in 1998, after a disagreement where he refused to marry her, she videotaped items that he had allegedly stolen from work and sent the tape to his boss. Now, despite the items being out-of-date medical kits that he'd scavenged from the company bins, he was fired from the job that he'd held for 17 years. Oh, my God. Kicked her out the same day, gossip spread around town what she'd done. But a few months later, they'd rekindled the relationship, with him initially refusing to let her move back in with him. The fighting got worse, and in the end, most of his friends refused to have anything to do with him while he was with her so you know they could see it was messed up toxic abusive and obviously they've been trying to get him out of it for some time and he just you know you know what it's like like it's hard to get out from under an abusive thumb yes so in february 2000 a series of assaults on price ended with knight stabbing him in the chest again he kicked her out of the house. On February 29th, he took out a restraining order on her at the Scons Magistrates Court on his way to work. The same afternoon, he told his co-workers that if they didn't see him the next day, it would be because she killed him. Now, allegedly, they attempted to keep him from returning home, but he was worried about his kids, hey? Yeah. Like, if I don't go home, like, my kids' lives are in danger. So It's one of those things that are an abusive person will use to dangle over your head. Yep, absolutely. But when Price got home, the house was empty. Um, Knight wasn't there and she'd sent the kids to go for a sleepover at a friend's. So he spent the evening at his neighbor's place, hung out, came home, went to bed at about 11. At some point throughout the night, Knight came back to the house and she woke him up and they had sex before he returned to sleep. Now, if this was a movie, would you not be screaming at the screen? Just like, run! I know I would be. Yeah, I would have gone to, like, where my kids were, grabbed them and bailed. Like, that's the perfect time to leave. Absolutely. Like, if you genuinely think that you're going to die that night, you you don't stay there. You don't just chill out insane but i guess when you live in danger a fair amount of the time it becomes your normal yeah price did not show up for work the next day oh god his boss sent someone around to his place to check on him same vein the neighbors were concerned because they could see his car was still in the drive they tried knocking on his window to wake him And then they realised that there was blood on the doorstep and on the door handle. So they called the police. As you do, because that's terrifying. Yes. When the police arrived, they gained entry via the back door and found Knight unconscious after having consumed a large number of pills. Oh dear. That was the least of what they saw. So... A lot of this comes from a medical report from here. They found that after Price had returned to bed, after they'd had sex, Knight began stabbing him in his sleep. He managed to get past her, tried to turn the light switch on in the hallway as he was escaping. He got to the front door. He opened the front door, hence the blood on the outside handle. But either he stumbled back in, not likely, or he was dragged back in. The autopsy report showed that he'd been stabbed at least 37 times. And there may have been more wounds inflicted, but the extent of those found and subsequent acts done to the body made it impossible to know how many more there may have been. Many of these wounds were deep and extended into vital organs, including the aorta, both lungs, 
the liver, the stomach, the distended, descended colon, the pancreas, and the left kidney, the lower pole of which had been virtually sliced off. This, of course, resulted in serious blood loss. Blood was found splattered and smeared in various parts of the house and in a rather deep pool in the hallway which measured one metre by two metres. By the time the police had arrived, the blood hadn't actually completely congealed in that pool and was only dry on the edges. This is like hours later. But it's actually what Knight did next that sets her apart from your run-of-the-mill crazies. A few hours after Price had expired from his leaving, Knight dragged the body to the lounge room and she did what she did best. She skinned him and butchered him. She hung his pelt on a meat hook she had installed in the architrave of the door to the lounge room, which was found and later removed by investigators. Another quote from the report, This was carried out with considerable expertise and an obviously steady hand so that his skin, including that of the head, face, nose, neck, torso, genital organs, and legs, was removed so as to form one pelt. So expertly was it done that after the post-mortem examination, the skin was able to be re-sewn onto Mr. Price's body in a way which indicated a clear and appropriate, albeit grisly, methodology. She would then go on to decapitate and pose Price's head, left arm and legs in a further act of defilement. She then sliced off his buttocks and baked them in the oven and stewed his head alongside some vegetables she had prepared. Now, some of this was located in the backyard, which causes the speculation that she may have engaged in cannibalism or she was feeding him to the dogs. There is no proof or evidence either way. But the rest of these gruesome steaks were arranged on a plate with the aforementioned vegetables with place-setting notes for Price's children. She was straight up going to serve him to his kids. Damn! She could have at least baked him into a pie like Arya Stark did to What's-His-Face. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he was baked, but wow. Wow. Dude also should have had sex with her four times. Oh no, that was the other one. (laughs) I know. There seems to be a number. Here's the thing. Initially, Knight agreed to plead guilty to manslaughter, claiming she had no recollection of the night. All she says that she remembers from the night is she got in, they had good sex, both of them climaxed, and she went to sleep. She has since been given the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, so it is possible that she was dissociated at the time, but bloody hell, that's terrifying. I know. I would still also love to be able to um, claim reduced accountability for all of my actions based on, I don't remember. Obviously, the prosecution weren't having a bar of it, so she decided to plead not guilty at her arraignment in Feb 2001. But in October 2001, by her trial, she changed her plea to not guilty for no reason that she's ever given. Uh, Not before 60 jury prospects were given the opportunity to back out because of the gruesome nature of the case. It's probably a testimony to uh, how obsessed with morbidity we are that only five of them actually accepted that opportunity to back out. Yeah. So, despite never having given a reason why she changed her plea, she also never took accountability for her actions. Her lawyers even asked for her to be excused from hearing some of the details of the proceeding. Like, I don't even want to know what I did. Which, obviously, was rejected. Good. During the testimony of Dr. Timothy Lyons regarding the skinning and decapitation, Knight became hysterical and they actually had to sedate her. Sorry. Was that genuine though, or is that just a show for the courts? Yeah, who knows. On the 8th of November 2001, 
Justice O'Keefe stated that due to the serious nature of the crime and the complete lack of remorse, Knight would serve life in prison. He refused to fix a non-parole period and simply had her papers stamped never to be released. This is the first time it has ever been imposed on a woman in Australian history. Now, Knight did attempt to appeal the life sentence in June 2006, claiming it was too harsh a punishment for the murder. Excuse me? (laughs) Right. Wow. Yeah. She was almost immediately shot down by the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal. There was three judges involved in the decision, one of them, Justice Peter McClellan, Uh, in his judgment, wrote, this was an appalling crime almost beyond contemplation in a civilised society. Yeah, like, you didn't just murder him. You skinned him like an animal and tried to feed him to his kids. Possibly ate some of Vanessa. Like, I... I had no idea up until recently that something like this had transpired in our country. No. Me either. It was a total mind blow. And the fact that a, a crime this violent was committed by a w- woman, w- women aren't normally known for overly violent crimes. Yeah. But then when it would have gone into the courts, which would have been when it was in the media, I was very a self, self-obsessed teenager at the time. So. Oh, yeah, did I? I, I would have not have about what happened. Yeah. But even but since damn. we started this up, like, I only came across this, like, a couple of weeks ago. I think I'd seen it briefly beforehand, and I hadn't actually looked into it too far, but... Mm-mm. So, um, there were two different accounts of which prison she's in, so can't give you the prison she's in, but she is still in prison, and she always will be. Yeah. Which is a brilliant outcome. Um, how did it get this far? She knew how to manipulate the system to be on her side because this is before um, there was an awareness on women being the abuser in a domestic violence home. Yeah, but you would think after the first few stab wounds to people or the slash in the face to the woman, the holding a little boy hostage at the gas station... Like, that went down during her first marriage. Yeah. The fact that she could check herself out of a hospital, like a mental health hospital. Um, Also, a lot of that happened during a time period where women weren't diagnosed with anything other than hysteria. Or postnatal depression, which was one of her diagnoses at the time. Yeah. So... There's just a lot of oversights across the board. Yep. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, as I was reading it, I'm just like, this is, this is legitimately insane. Like, if that was a movie, I would just be like, you know what, the director's carried it too far for shock value. Yeah. Also, smaller towns as well handle things differently. True. But Pricey was well loved in in the town, so yeah, people already didn't really like her. True. Oof. What happened to her daughters at the end? No idea. Oh, actually, all her kids, because she had a son in the end too, didn't she? Yeah, three daughters and a son. Yeah. No idea. I'd be lying if I said I didn't at least attempt to have a little bit of a sus about it. I didn't go hard because obviously, you know, privacy and all, but I yeah. did have a quick look and I couldn't conclusively find any of them or anything on what their, became of their lives after all this. I was going to say the youngest one was born the same year as me. Yeah. And I'm just like in my head, like, what if that was my mum? Yeah. And I mean, if that was my mum, I wouldn't be sticking my hand up saying that that's my mum. I would be changing no. my name. Oh, yeah. Did I? Possibly moving across 
country. Like I'd be living yeah. in WA somewhere. <laughs> other side, other side. Let's just, just yes. all the way over there. Yeah. No, that's that's fair. I mean, and of course, me being me, I'm a bit self-centered, so I'm always going to think of it like, oh, that's the closest person I can relate to in this whole <laughs> mess. As I said, sad start to a story, twisted as fuck ending. So she wasn't exactly set up for success, but she did take it too far. It's a perfect example of the absolute worst a human could turn out as a result of that level of abuse. Yeah. I mean, a lot of abuse victims in childhood end up being toxic to some degree or another. Quite often they do go on to become an abuser themselves, but that... Well, she Next excelled level. in that the way she excels in skinning. So... Mm. She was good at something? It's, it's not even just the being good at it. The fact that she managed to cleave him the way that she did shows that there was zero hesitation. Yeah. None. Not a bat of an eyelid. How? How can you have so little respect for life or humanity? I I just got, got nothing. I got nothing either. Aside from the woman has a fucked up love map. <sighs> so, that does wrap that up. <laughs> and, uh, on a morbid note, as always, you can catch us on our socials. We are on Instagram at Strange Colony 2.0. We are on Twitter at Strange Colony. We have Facebook, Strange Colony Podcast. I forgot to look up the TikTok again, so you don't get that this week. And we have a Gmail account, which is strangecolony at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe. Stay sane. Keep your skin on. <laughs> I should not have laughed at that bit. You caught me off guard. <laughs> we love you. I love bye. you. Bye.